After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Greek, Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in the city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the, Jew of, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Gallio showed no concern whatever. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centricae because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos went, wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed for he vigorously refuted the, his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. The title of today's passage is, Do Not Be Afraid, Keep on Speaking. The passage is Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 28, with the key verses being verse 9 and 10. As we studied last week, Paul had many difficulties while preaching the gospel in Athens. While many were interested in hearing what he had to say, most of the Athenians in attendance regarded it as either pure nonsense or an amusing intellectual exercise. They were not like the Bereans who, upon hearing the gospel with great eagerness, took its claims seriously by studying it in the light of scripture day and night. The Athenians were too busy with their own ideas of how to live the best life and worshiping the gods of their own making that they had no desire for the creator God who is revealed to us through the Old Testament. This is why they scoffed at the idea of a man being raised from the dead. Even though Jesus is God himself in human flesh who came down from heaven to reveal who God truly is. In doing so, Jesus showed us the best and only way to live life to the fullest. So sensing that there was nothing else he could do there, Paul left Athens and headed for the nearby city of Corinth. Going from Athens to Corinth, as the old saying goes, 
is like jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Corinth was the capital of Achaia and one of the largest cities in the entire Roman Empire with a population of at least half a million. So for context, the population of Corinth was 20 times the size of Athens. As a port city, it was an important transit hub that brought people and trade from all over the empire, including wonderful architecture and lots of bronze work. However, Corinth was most infamously known for its sexual immorality, drunkenness and debauchery. In fact, the word Corinthian was used for those, was used by those outside of the city to describe an immoral or promiscuous person. So the word Corinthian was a great insult. Making matters worse was that the sexual immorality of the city had religious underpinnings. On a hill located behind the city was a temple of Aphrodite, which was home to a thousand shrine prostitutes. They would descend into the city to seduce people figuratively and literally into taking part in their rituals and worship of their goddess. As many of you know, our situation is not too different for, from Paul, for we are trying to share the gospel on a university campus that feels very much like Athens, while right in the middle of the city that is proudly Corinthian, as evident by all the festivities and celebrations that we witnessed last weekend, it would be perfectly understandable for Paul to just skip the city and say, ah, oh, there's nothing I can do there. It is a lost cause. However, God had a heart for the people, Corinth. God had great hope for the city of Corinth to be a city where a community of believers would not only exist, but thrive. Likewise, I pray that through this passage, we can have that same love and hope, not just for our campus of U of T, but for our entire city of Toronto. In verses two and three, we meet Priscilla and Aquila. They were a Jewish couple who had to leave Rome because of an edict issued by Emperor Claudius where all the Jews had to leave. They too were recent arrivals to Corinth. And because they were fellow tent makers, Paul stayed with and worked together with them. But why was Paul a tent maker? He did it so that he can support himself on his journeys by having a useful and transferable skill. Even though he was entitled to financial support from the church and from the new believers in all the places that he preached at, he wanted to make it clear to those he preached to that he was not doing so out of a desire for money or fame, as was the custom of many traveling teachers and scholars of that day. His profession was for the sake of serving his preaching and not the other way around. Likewise, we are called to view our jobs in the same way. And so we have many people here who are in the process of job searching or some people who are currently in a job who are hoping for something better. So our prayer should not be, Lord, Please give me this job. The better prayer is, Lord, how can I please you and serve you through this job? By placing God as the priority, even the most humble of jobs can be used for his great service. And this is what we will see in Priscilla and Aquila. But we will save that for the end of the message. Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila were similar in many ways. Jewish tent makers who were kicked out of their city for their religious relief, for their religious beliefs. But most important of all was their shared love for Jesus Christ. Because of this, they became such great friends to the point where they willingly risked their lives for the sake of Paul and the gospel. And we will find that out at the end of the book of Romans. Here, we can see God at work as he placed people in Paul's life to help him in his mission. God saw how lonely and difficult it had been for Paul. 
And so God sent people to Paul at the right place and at the right time. And this is further proven by the arrival of Timothy and Silas from Macedonia in verse 5. Elsewhere in Paul's letters, we learn that they came with financial aid from the Philippian believers. And so when you put all of this together, it meant that Paul was able to go from reasoning at the synagogue once a week to devoting himself exclusively to preaching full time, testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah, rather than viewing God's providence as a chance to sit back and take it easy. Paul saw this as God's clear call to press on and work even harder to share the gospel with the people of Corinth. Paul was like a Formula One car with a full tank of rocket fuel freshly pumped in. But how was his message received? So let us look at verse 6. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. This is another reminder to us that preaching is not easy. We are called to expect rejection because many people did the same thing to Jesus himself. So if you truly live for Christ's mission, then expect all kinds of opposition. Furthermore, it is ironic that this gesture of shaking the dust off of your clothes was not only a form of rebuke, but also done when Jewish people crossed over from Gentile territory back into Jewish territory so that they wouldn't carry the dust with them and be impure. Now, Paul did it to show that he would preach to the Gentiles of Corinth instead. And notice how he went about it. In a bold move, Paul went to the closest Gentile he could find, who fortunately was a fellow worshiper of God who lived right next door to the synagogue. And while there is a lot of humor in this act, it had a profound effect on those who were nearby, as we see in verse 8. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. What started off as a ministry of three people had now flourished to the point where even the synagogue leader and his entire household gave their lives to Christ. Paul should have been on top of the world because of all that was taking place. However, let us read verse 9 together. There seems to be a big disconnect between what we see in verse 8 and what we see in verse 9. If everything was going so well in terms of the ministry, why were God's first words to Paul, do not be afraid? It is because he was. We know this from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, as he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. So just think about everything Paul, everything Paul endured to get to this point. He lost his dear co-worker in Christ due to a sharp disagreement. He was also blinded, fell ill, beaten, stoned, arrested, imprisoned, isolated, slandered, rejected, and chased out of almost every city and region that he had visited. We like to think of Paul as Superman for how he kept on going and going like a preaching machine. But at the end of the day, he too is only human. All the pain and all the hurt that had been stacking up to this point made him feel that he could not go on any further. So have you ever experienced such a season in your life where everything on the outside looks great and fantastic, but inside of you is the exact opposite? Everyone would think that you are on an emotional and spiritual high, but you yourself know that your inner being feels like it is dying. Such seasons are often the hardest for any believer to go through 
because you feel that no one can truly understand you or know what is going on within you. However, God sees you. God knows everything that you are going through. And just as he did for Paul, God is speaking to you through his word and is telling you to not be afraid. He is calling on you to keep on walking with him and trusting in him by living out and sharing the gospel continuously. Why? So let us read our key verses for today's passage in their entirety. God wanted to remind Paul of three promises. They can be best summarized as God's presence, God's protection, and God's purpose. First, God wanted Paul to take courage because of the fact that God was with him. So often, we become fearful and fall into despair because we forget the fact that God is here with us. God promised the prophet Isaiah, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And Jesus himself, as he ascended into heaven, concluded his final words to his disciples by telling them, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God constantly sends us so many reminders of this wonderful truth, whether it is by his word or through other people. And he has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit as proof of this. So when you feel lonely, remember that he is already here with you and that all you need to do is to draw closer to him. Second, God promised Paul that no harm would befall him because Paul was under God's sovereign protection. While we do not live in a land where people might try to physically harm us for our faith in Christ, we worry over being excluded by others for our old, stupid, and intolerant beliefs. For many, this is a fate worse than death. However, God has saved us from eternal condemnation, a fate that is actually worse than death. So let us be more like King David, who even when he was surrounded by enemies on all sides, could boldly declare, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Lastly, God assured Paul by saying that he had many people in the city of Corinth. This must have been a total shock to Paul. How could God have many people in such a wicked and godless city as Corinth? Through human eyes, Corinth was spiritually like a barren wasteland. Yet in God's eyes, Corinth was an abundant harvest field just waiting to be reaped. It is in situations and places like this that we are called to carry the gospel with us. God already has those he has predestined to be saved. We do not know who exactly they are, for God didn't give us the spiritual equivalent of x-ray vision. It would make our club day so much easier and efficient if we could instantly identify those who were truly interested in knowing more about Jesus. However, there is one very effective way to find out, and that is by sharing the gospel with those who God puts around us. We are all here because someone went out of their way to share the gospel with us in the first place. And God promises us that they will be those who will eagerly answer his calling. And this should be an encouragement to us all. It was for Paul, and it resulted in him spending another year and a half in Corinth. So this is the longest time that he spent in any city up to this point in his missionary journeys. Verses 12 through 17 depict an incident that put all of God's promises to Paul to the test. Once again, 
a group of Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia. It looked like Paul was set to be flogged and imprisoned all over again, or maybe worse. But as Paul was getting ready to plead his defense, Gallio intervened and made a ruling of his own. By declaring this a religious matter instead of a political one, Paul was found innocent of any wrongdoing and was set free without even saying a single word. God used a non-believer to protect Paul and by extension, all the Corinthian Christians who were allowed to enjoy freedom of religion. And it is interesting to note that the Sosthenes mentioned here as the synagogue leader is most likely the same one mentioned at the start of 1 Corinthians as Paul's fellow brother in Christ. So even he could not deny the power of God's work on full display. After this incident, Paul spent some more time in Corinth before deciding to end his second missionary journey. As he was accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila, he stopped at Sancreia and cut his hair due to a vow that he had made. So what was that vow? Perhaps it was the Nazarite vow, a solemn promise to dedicate yourself fully to the Lord. It could also have been a promise to focus more on discipleship, as this will be the theme of his third and final missionary journey. But whatever the reason, it is vital for each of us to have a vow like this that we keep in such an outward and intentional manner. And this is why we are especially joyful for those who have been baptized or are getting baptized over the next few weeks. As Paul left Corinth, God was already preparing someone else to carry on his work. Apollos was a learned man from Alexandria. He had thorough knowledge of the scriptures, instructed in the way of the Lord, and spoke with great passion and accurately about Jesus, even though all he knew was the baptism of John. So most likely, he knew the baptism of repentance and how Jesus was the Messiah. When he met Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, they eagerly invited him into their home and explained the way of God to him more adequately. When we normally meet brilliant and intelligent people such as Apollos, we tend to shy away from sharing the gospel with them because we feel inadequate sharing something so simple with them. However, our cute Christian couple did not allow this to dissuade them. In fact, they saw this as even more of a reason to speak to him, to open their home to him, and to help him know God deeper than before. This helped Apollos not only to preach mightily in Ephesus, but also to grow the church in Corinth even more once he moved over there. So this goes to show that every believer in Christ has something worth sharing, no matter their status, their achievements, intellect, nor even how long they have been a Christian. All you need is one clear word of God and the willingness to open up your very life in order for the light of Christ to shine through. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, okay, Let's see, be more like Priscilla and Aquila. So, okay, the married couple, names that rhyme, they, they, well, what else do they have? The time makers, okay, they have the same job, same passion. They also help a man from Africa who knows a little bit about Jesus, but helped him to know even more and be able to go speak eloquently to others. So, hmm, I, I wonder who they could be. I wonder. So for those who don't know, these were the two people who opened up their home and their very life to me and helped me to know the gospel even more. So we met Peter when he came last February, and quite a few of us will meet Rebecca when she'll be at the conference in August. So in conclusion, what ties all these events together is God's promises to all of us. We are called to keep speaking 
even in the middle of all our fears. Paul couldn't have made such wonderful friends and co-workers in Christ if he had stopped speaking. Apollos wouldn't have been able to be such a powerful defender of the gospel if Priscilla and Aquila hadn't spoken to him and opened their very lives to him. And so many people in Corinth would still be in the slavery to sin if nobody told them the good news of the real God of love, Jesus Christ. It is he who is the only one who can give you life to the fullest and transforms all your desires into something that will ultimately glorify him. This is the same charge given to each and every one of us. God has given you the same promise that he has given Paul. So let us relish in this glorious opportunity to change the lives of so many here in Toronto. Take heart and embrace the fact that you are never alone in doing the work of the Lord, for he will always surround you with his people and be with you always. And who are those very people in question? You will have to talk to them and find out. So the big idea, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking.